talked about the message and the brand, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is delivering that brand through a lot of different channels. What I'm going to be talking about first is delivering that brand and that messaging through your website. Your website's unique, isn't it? I pace a lot, just for the record, so get your necks ready. <laughs> your website's very important. It's, it, it's, it's a very unique marketing channel, isn't it? It's a marketing channel in itself, obviously. But it's also one of the marketing channels that a lot of the other ones point to. Your print ad has your website address on it. Your radio spot mentions your website. Your TV spot mentions your website, usually. Your online marketing links to your website, your URL. It's one of the most important impressions you're going to make, because it's usually the first impression you make. So you've got to make sure you do a good job, because if you don't do a good job and make a good first impression, you might not convert that visitor to a customer, that person that walked through the door to a customer, and you're wasting dollars. And that sounds like common sense, because I know I'm not telling you something you don't know. You're all nodding your head. Yes, Ryan, get on with it. That's obvious. We all know that. But the problem is a lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of agencies, a lot of designers don't necessarily know what a good website looks like. Because sometimes you'll find stuff like this. It's a beauty. It's probably going to take you 20 seconds to figure out actually what this company does. I'll speed it up a little bit. It's a training car driving school thing. <laughs> yeah, I know, huh? And I know this is an extreme example, but if I were to follow a campaign or a marketing channel and I ended up here, I would bounce. I would leave instantly. Because I don't know what this person is yelling at me. I could take, you know, if I actually look at this thing, I realize they operate in Virginia because they have a flag and they mention it five times. <laughs> There's this guy that's really scared teaching this other guy how to drive. That's probably not the best thing for the brand. We know we have women in white sweaters doing squats behind monitors. <laughs> And a gentleman really paying attention in class, and a girl behind him not paying any attention whatsoever. And some seals of approval. The point is, whoever designed this forgot what's important. They threw everything at us. They thought, what are we going to show on our website? We need to tell them everything and show them everything. And they didn't take the time to figure out what's important. Because when you're in a sales process, when someone walks through the door, it's no different than online. You don't dump everything on them. You walk them through that process. Buying something is an exploratory process, isn't it? You help convert them. You tell them who you are, like who you are, not your name, what you do, why you do it, why you're better than your competitors. And I'm going to say that a lot. It's going to sound repetitive. And when you're designing a good website, or any marketing campaign for that matter, you need to start thinking about what is important. And you need to figure out what the most important thing is and what the least important thing is. And that's what's going to help you design better products and better messaging. And that sounds like common sense, too. When you design a website that you want to say the most important thing first, you want to give a really good impression. But the problem is, is we get distracted when we build visual-based things, don't we? <laughs> when we start talking about a website, quite often in a kickoff meeting, we'll hear, I really like this color. Can this color be the color of my website? Why? My building is this color. Can this be the color of my website? No, because it doesn't matter. Your color that you like doesn't tell me who you are, it doesn't tell me what you do, it doesn't tell me why you do it, and it doesn't tell me why you're better than your competitors. Your messaging, your brand, and your content do, so choose it wisely. Another one I hear all the time, our logo. We spent all this money on this logo. We love it, and it's a good logo. We need a big, we need a bigger, I want you know, like one third of the site, just my logos. So people know who we are when we get there. They know who you are when they got there because they followed some way to get there. They're already preconditioned to where they're going. I'm not saying don't have your logo. I'm just saying it doesn't need to be the biggest thing on your site because it doesn't tell me who you are. It tells me your name, but that's not who you are, is it? It doesn't tell me what you do unless your name has auto body in it. It doesn't tell me why you do it. More importantly, it doesn't tell me why you're better than your competitors your brand, your content, and your messaging do. So that's why when we sit down and we start talking about our custom design process, when we build sites, we start talking about content first, this idea of content first design. And this is sort of a roadmap that leads us uh, in a way to make, oh, there we go, oopsies, leads us in a way to make really high quality products that make sure you're telling your customers the important thing first. 
And this isn't just something we do. This is an ideology that you could use anywhere when you're designing any sort of ad campaign, any sort of website, any sort of marketing collateral. Think about content first. Last year, for the people that were joining us last year, we talked about mobile first. They're very similar, because a mobile device kind of makes you focus on content, especially when you're a designer, because you only have three inches or so. So you don't have a whole lot of real estate you have to really decide what the most important thing is. If I loaded that car website up on my phone, I wouldn't be able to even see anything. And I had to scroll in, scroll out, zoom around. It would be a horrible experience. And I would leave on my phone even quicker than it took me to leave on my desktop device. And I just want to touch quickly why mobile devices are so important. And this next slide is going to be a little repetitive for anyone who was here last year, but it's just very important. And I want to share it again because the numbers, they speak for themselves. Last year, the United Nations released some numbers, some estimates, or a subcommittee of the United Nations that monitors telecommunications, stuff like that. They estimated that in the Americas, there are 150 million broadband connections. That's a lot. It's a hell of a lot. When I say broadband connections, I'm talking about your computer at home, usually, or your laptop. Uh, something that's connected to a Wi-Fi network, and then to a modem, and then into the wall. That's your SHA, your TELUS. That's your high-speed internet that you're using to consume content, interact with brands, purchase products. And that's the number that everyone's been talking about all these years. And people have been saying, get online. You need a website. You're a dinosaur. Yada, yada. And we've all heard the speech, right? You have to be online. We all know that now. But that's the number they were talking about. And it's an impressive number. The thing is, mobile broadband is twice that. So why, all these years, have we been focusing on creating experiences for desktop users first. It's bass backwards. The market is twice as big. And as designers and as, as, as web designers and agencies, we've been guilty too. Because nice, big, wide monitors allows us to really flex our muscles. And you know, we like to show cool things and cool photography. But we forget what's important, and that's the content. Because it doesn't matter how pretty your website is or how pretty your collateral is. If you're not saying the right things, you're not going to convert visitors to customers. Before I move on, just one more number. Mobile subscriptions in general in the Americas is 1 billion. Absolutely dwarfs broadband connections. It's time to stop treating mobile users as second class citizens. Because we do, don't we? You know, we build nice, beautiful sites. And then we make a little knockdown version that just has a contact us button. Maybe those mobile users actually want a little more information from us. Maybe they don't want to have to scroll in and zoom in and zoom out to see your content. Your content matters. Your content is important. And it's an extremely efficient sales funnel, mobile users. Uh, one thing, 91% of adults have their smartphone within arm's reach. How often? That doesn't say how often. Often. <laughs> it's an extremely efficient way to advertise to someone. People are always consuming your brand, consuming your content, consuming your media. Uh, nine out of 10 people that search on mobile, so if you search for a business or search for a service on your phone, nine out of those 10 searches tend to lead to an action. When I say action, I mean buy a product, phone your business, find out information about you, follow you on Twitter, something that interacts with your brand. Action is good. Out of that 9 out of 10, half of those actually convert to sales. This is an extremely efficient sales funnel. It'd be silly to ignore it. This one's new to me. This one I just found a couple weeks ago. And I, I just wanted to share. 70% of those mobile searches that we just chatted about, they lead to an action within one hour. That's an extremely quick sales funnel as well as an efficient one. It takes a full month for desktop users to catch up to that. So the point is, don't forget about mobile users. Which brings me back to content design first. But before I get that, because I jumped ahead, I want to talk about responsive web design. And that is actually how we help mobile users. And using content first design, we could build really great responsive experiences. And some of you might not know what a responsive website is, so I'm just going to quickly show you. This is clonanow.com. This is a responsive website. At first glance, it looks like your traditional desktop website. It's wide, it has multiple columns, big pictures. But if I scroll back up here and I pull in the side, you're going to see how the site responds to the width of my browser window or 
the width of my device. It's the same content. We've just organized it in a matter that works really good for a mobile device. And now we have a site that works on a phone, a tablet, a TV screen, a monitor, a laptop, anything. And we've ordered it from most important thing to least important thing. And in the case of Clona Now, because it's news related, it's the most recent to the least recent, because news is timely. Another example, big boys do this too. This is Starbucks.com, and I showed this last year too. This is their homepage. Looks like we'd expect from a traditional desktop website, media, videos, multiple columns. But as I pull in the width here, it responds to the width of my viewport, all the way down to what you'd expect from something on a phone. This is responsive web design. It's the idea that you deliver the same content to all of your users, because all of your users matter. Which brings us back to content-first design. And content-first design is just basically, and I'm going to show you how we actually do it. I'm going to go through the process. We're actually going to build a site together today, and I'll, I'll do the heavy lifting. Don't worry. And, and it'll be easier to understand what I'm trying to say as we go through it. And, and what I'm going to do is build a site, or at least the home page, for the brand that Tony introduced, mensoverandunder.com. This is a men's luxury, high fashion, online only at this point, retail outlet. This company doesn't exist, so we're going to have some fun with it. Uh, and we'll hopefully have a couple little laughs. So let's say we're starting this. We're starting with this, the kickoff meeting, boom, there's the kick. Uh, we need to figure out what we want on the home page. That's what we're going to design today. And when you're designing with content first, you have to figure out what the most important content is. It's kind of obvious. And the first step isn't really that sexy. It actually starts in Notepad. Anyone can do this. And we need to start planning out what we want to see on that home page. And we list it from most important thing that we want to see to the least important thing. It's kind of like a mobile experience, right? The first thing you see is the most important. It's at the top of your screen. The least important thing, you have to scroll all the way to the bottom. It's very vertical, like a list. So for men's over and under, we want to see the logo. I joked about the logo thing earlier. I'm not saying don't use it. You need it. It does tell me your name. It helps me recognize you. It just doesn't need to take up your entire screen. We need to have navigation. We're an e-commerce site. Of course we need navigation to show all of our products. But pretty much any website needs navigation. And usually, we're all pretty familiar with how websites work. Navigation tends to be at the top. We don't want to screw up that experience for anyone. We want a spot to show some good brand imagery. I don't know what that imagery is yet but I know we're going to use it to kind of promote our featured product or featured promotion or whatever we're trying to sell that season. So for, for fun, you know, it's Christmas time almost. If you guys haven't heard the Christmas music, I know I have. So moving forward, we're going to, we're going to pretend we have this kind of Christmas seasonal set that we're trying to sell to stylish gentlemen. Uh, after that, uh, we want to make sure we talk about our jackets. Our jackets are a hot seller. We want to talk about accessories. Accessories are a hot seller. They're not more important than jackets, though, which is why it's lower on the list. I know that's obvious behind me, but it's important. We want a spot for promotions. We're going to be doing some online marketing with our brand, too, and I'll be talking about that later this afternoon. But say if we have a Facebook promotion, or someone came to our site and wants to find out about promotions that we're doing, we want a spot to highlight that. It's not more important than selling jackets, which is why it's lower on the list. People will see jackets before they see the promotion. That is important to note. We have a style guide. And I'm going to touch more on that a little bit later. But the style guide essentially is going to be our place for a lot of our online marketing tactics. It's going to be a place where we create content and we post content. It's going to be a place where our authors could write really nice articles with really nice video and really great photography. And in there, on these fashion guides or, or things like that, we might have little links to our products that are featured in the article, kind of a way to passively sell it and bring traffic. And then we're going to use that for social media and all that kind of stuff. But I'll, I'll come back to that later. But that's the style guide. It's important. It's not more important than selling jackets. But we want it on the site. We want someone to be able to find it or stumble across it. Uh, we're an online retailer, so we want to mention we do free shipping because we feel like that's important. Uh, we have our social media near the bottom. Um, social media is, I know, a hot topic right now. But primarily, for most cases, it's meant to drive traffic to your site, not the other way around. That's why I have it near the bottom. Uh, we have a newsletter that we want people to sign up to and that we're going to use to communicate with our current clients, promotions, yada, 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 miscellaneous legal stuff at the bottom, refund policies, you know, the non-fun stuff. But it needs to be there, most important to least important. And this is the hard work. It looks easy, but this is when you start asking the really important questions. Are jackets more important than accessories? Is our refund policy 
and free shipping verbiage, less or more important than style guide. And this is where we start moving things around. Not later when we have photos that distract us, because sometimes you know, we just have a really nice photo, we're like, oh, we need that on the top of the site, that's a great photo, or a nice little piece of copy, oh, we need to promote that. But it, not, it doesn't necessarily mean it's important. This allows us to make the important decisions without getting distracted by things like white space, color, photography. And this is when we move it. Once we've locked this down, and we could all agree that this is really the important things we need to say, we convert that to what we call a mobile wireframe. And this is what it looks like. It's very similar. It's uh, top to bottom, most important to least important. Uh, and we actually have real verbiage now, but it follows the same order, doesn't it? Logo, menu, our main call to action, jackets, accessories. Uh, there's our fresh sneaker contest for our promotion. We have our men's style guide with a little bit of copy. Uh, I think then we go on to our free shipping and returns, social media newsletter, etc. You'll notice there's no colors or no photography. We're not there yet. We're focusing on our message and our content because the content is what's going to sell. I said it before, if your site's pretty and has nice photography, that's cool, people will look at it. But if you're not telling them the right things at the right time, you're not going to convert them. And this is a very boring mock-up. It's just very straight up, straight down, just like the notepad document to the right of it. On a wide desktop experience, it looks poopy, is the professional word for it. <laughs> Once we have that locked down, this is an easy step, because we already have everything to the right. We know exactly what we're doing. We then, we take this and we create a desktop mock-up. And this is a responsive site. So we start from our mobile one, because we're talking about mobile first design, right? But then we add some structure to it. So as I bring out the width of the screen, we start seeing how it focuses on more of a grid-based layout that would be familiar with a desktop environment. And it's the exact same content, the exact same messaging, just in a nice way. And from top to bottom and left to right, because that's how we read, we have the most important to the least important. We're focusing on our content first. And still, no branding, no photography, even the logos in grayscale at this point. Uh, and we have this mock-up that we could even test on our phone already. Like, we could actually open this up in our browser, we could open our phone, we could test it on a whole bunch of different devices. So we already have this working prototype. It's a really cool way to design. Then comes the fun part. This is the part that everyone gets excited about, that they, you know, they jump the gun, like, I want this photo, and I want this color, and things like that. We apply sort of a skin to it. You know, we use the brand's color palette and the photography that they have. So, without further ado, with the help of AMC's Mad Men, because they are very stylish, they're not an official sponsor, don't sue me, AMC, uh, I introduce mensoverandunder.com. And it's very similar to the previous mock-up, isn't it? It's just we now have photos in it. But it actually looks like a real website. And it's saying the important things first. We have our logo. We have our navigation. We have our featured brand image and product, our Christmas offering. We're talking about jackets. We're talking about accessories. We're talking about our promotion, our style guide, our shipping policy, social media, newsletter, so on. That's content first design. Quickly, because I don't know if I have to smash this by any means, but we go from our content inventory, come on, to our mobile wireframe, to our desktop wireframe, and then to a finished product. And the cool thing is, this is a fully functional, responsive homepage now. So you have a site that looks great in your iPhone or your Android device, something that's very tiny. You have something that works in a tablet. And you have something that's optimized and from most important to least important also works in a desktop device. Mobile first and content first are kind of made for each other. So that's content first design. And that's what it looks like. And that's what the process looks like when we go through it with, with some of our clients. And then you launch. After a whole bunch of other steps, you know, if we were building men's over and under, we'd obviously do secondary pages, build products, photos, things like that. And we'd create this site and we'd launch it. The neat thing about websites is that you can change them after, can't you? You know, Tony talked about defining your message and I chatted quickly about, you know, how you build that message into your website. But with a brochure, you hand it out and you hope people come in the door or they don't. You don't really know why it worked or why it didn't work sometimes, unless you actually physically go out and hammer people and make them tell you. And they still might not tell you the truth because you're in front of them. The nice thing about a website is we could actually kind of see what's happening. We could see the pain points. We could see where we're losing customers. We could see where customers are coming from. 
Those are important things to know. And using that, we could actually refine our online strategy. Because the website's dynamic. And that's, when I say neat, that's, that's what I mean. It's, it's something we can consistently change and optimize. It's kind of like a car. You could always make it a little bit faster or a little bit lighter. And that's the beauty about websites. So I want to talk about measuring and refining, because that's the other half of the battle. The main tool we use to measure and said refine is Google Analytics. A lot of you are probably familiar with at least the name at a bare minimum. Some of you have maybe dabbled in there a little bit. It's an overwhelming piece of software. If you log in today, these are all of the reports that you could get. And you could fine tune those as well. It's a little overwhelming. I don't even know if I could talk to every single one of these reports. So I'm just going to talk about two things that are important that every business should be concentrating on. And it's very easy for you to find this information in your Google Analytics. And by the way, if you don't have access for your website, get it. You should have it. Uh, it's a free uh, platform, so your developer just has to put it in on your website, and you start tracking all this stuff right away. Get it. Important. So what I want to talk about are two things. Goals, so setting up goals and tracking goals on your website. And I want to talk a little bit about engagement. Engagement's the easier one to kind of grasp the concept of. But it's an important thing to look at. The, the, one of them is time on site. That's one of the two things that we track uh, engagement with, time on site. And it's pretty much exactly what it says it is. We could see in Google Analytics how long someone's been on your site. If they've been there for 10 seconds, that is not as good as someone being there for five minutes. Because that means for five minutes, they were consuming your brand, interacting, interacting with your site, looking at your products, finding out information about you. That's a very important metric to track. And when you make changes to your site, you can see if the time on site goes up or if the time on site goes down. You could see if people come from Facebook to a specific landing page, if they stay on the site longer than if someone comes from Twitter to the home page. And you could refine your strategy based off that. The other one that almost goes hand in hand with it is a bounce rate. Essentially, a bounce rate is the rate in which people leave your site. So if I come to your site today, and I'm your only visitor, and I leave right away, because you look like that car company in the first screen, that's a 100% bounce rate, one out of one. If 100 people come to your site and 50 of them leave right away, that's a 50% bounce rate. The math is easy to crunch. But the point of the game is to reduce that bounce rate as much as humanly possible. And that's really where a lot of optimization to your sites come into play, making sure that bounce rate is as low as possible, or as low as possible. It's, it's kind of like when you run a business. If you have people walking in the door, you don't want them to turn around and walk out. You want to make sure they look at your products and eventually go down that sales funnel until they actually make a purchase. So what does a bounce rate look like in real life? These are some fun stats that I made up for men's over and under, and I grayed out some of the stuff that isn't applicable. But what this is saying is on our homepage, that's what that slash means, it's our, our root URL, uh, we have a 45% bounce rate. And this is just a tool, it's two clicks again to Google Analytics. Um, what that means is 45% of people that are coming to the site are leaving right away. That's not a horrible bounce rate. But it's definitely not good. More importantly, there's things that we could do to reduce that bounce rate. I don't know what the answers are to reduce it yet, but I know I could start asking really important questions, like maybe do we change the color of a button? Do we have the, rad, the, do we have the wrong copy? Is the site not even working for some reason in some browsers? Because that's common too. I don't know the answers, but I know to start asking questions. More importantly, if I were to look at the style guide, I see there's a 95% bounce rate. That would be bad. <laughs> That's your red flag saying, oh god, something's wrong here. We have this style guide, we're investing all these resources in it, we're paying writers, photographers, videographers, but 95% of the people that are coming to it are leaving? That's a waste of dollars. That's a waste of a marketing channel. It's a waste of any dollars that you're using to promote the style guide. So either you can the style guide, or you figure out why it's not working. And I don't know why it's not working. It might be because this is the guy writing our style guide. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fire him. And hopefully that fixes the problem. And then we can keep monitoring the stats. If we look at, uh, let's say, another page, we have a page that all our Facebook traffic drives. So we have a Facebook, a promoted Facebook contest, where we're trying to get people's contact information, and generate leads, get on our newsletter list so we could tell them you know, our new products, new sales, things like that. We're trying to get information. But we have this Facebook contest page. And 98% of the people that come fill in the form. 2% bounce. That's a very good thing. That means 98% of the people coming are giving us, quite likely, their contact information. A lead is being generated. So that means two things about this page. One, 
We want to replicate whatever the hell we're doing there on all of our other pages, because it's working. Two, we want to post or push as much traffic as humanly possible to this page, because it has a very high conversion rate. At the end of the day, when you're looking at site metrics, it's all about conversions. It doesn't matter how many people come there. It doesn't matter how much traffic you have if none of those people convert into sales. A lot of people talk about hits and traffic for their, for their businesses. It doesn't matter. It's only part of the puzzle. And that brings me to goals. Goals are very specific questions that you can set up in Google Analytics to track things. And there's different types of goals. You know, there's the big picture goals. We call those macro goals. And there's small goals that lead to the big picture ones. We call those micro goals. Both are important. Because it's cold, especially this morning, and I'm Canadian, we're going to use a hockey analogy. Hopefully most of us are familiar with this sport. In hockey, there's only one goal. A goal. Getting the puck in the net. That's what we call a macro goal. At the end of the day, that's all you really want to do to win. That's the only way you can win. So on a product-based site, that might be selling a product. That would be a goal, wouldn't it? If you're a service-based business, because I know a lot of us are, that might just be a contact form submission, or even viewing our contact information, or maybe an RFP or RFQ submission. Those are good goals for service-based businesses. But there's lots of little things we could do and track and try to improve on that help make sure we get those macro goals. In hockey, you want to minimize the amount of injuries you have on ice. That's a good goal to have low set. Another one, obviously, would be not having very many penalty minutes. That's a micro goal. That's something a team could work on to try to improve their chances of having a macro goal. And we could do that with their website, too. And we could start asking important questions. For example, how many people clicked on the featured product when they went to our homepage? That's that big thing I had at the top. That's an important thing to track. Because if people aren't clicking on it, it's a waste of real estate. When we try to decide earlier what's important and what's not important, we made the assumption that that featured product is either important or that we designed it well. If we have low goal completions on that click-through, we know we didn't. We did something wrong. And like I said before, I don't know the answer, but now I know where to start looking for questions. Another one is, are people coming to our style guide and checking out our products? Our bounce rate definitely told us that that might not be the case. It's something we need to look into. Uh, like I said, if you're a service-based business, are people looking at your contact information? Are they filling in that request for quote? Are they signing up for a newsletter? Those little things are what help you generate leads. And that's a lot of service-based businesses, lead generation as opposed to actual product sales. That's an important funnel to track. And with Google Analytics, you can start tracking that. And you can start refining that. And that's how you get success out of your website. Because you have to refine. We launch a site, and we assume it's perfect. Because a whole team worked on it, and everyone's really passionate about it, and everyone put a lot of hours into it. And we launch it only when we're happy. We don't really launch a product that we're not happy with, do we? But we do make assumptions. So we need to track and refine our strategy. And that's very easy to do. I talked earlier about our style guide not performing well. We fired this guy, but the bounce rate is still really high. So something else is wrong. If I look closer, maybe all we did was forget to put a button at the bottom that says, browse our products. More information. Contact us. A few other things. Some sort of path for visitors to go through. We call that a call to action. And a lot of sites don't have calls to action. They brain dump on the page, and they leave it up to the customer, sorry, the visitor, to figure out what to do next. If you're at a grocery store, none of the aisles are dead ends. You just flow through, right? And that's what a good website does. We have calls to action. They're very important to the conversion process. So maybe that fixes our style guide. Another one, you know, we talked about that featured page, or the featured product on the home page. We're not seeing the conversions we want. We're not seeing the goal completions that we're hoping for. So we start playing with it. Maybe you know, it's the color of the button, because that does make a difference. There was some study, and don't quote me, quote me on this, but 70 or 700, it was a ridiculously large number. Um, Google changed the color of a button, and those are 70 or 700 different colors of blue. They tried so many different variations to find the one highest conversion rate. So there's lots of ways that we could experiment with things. So for example, we have this, the perfect Christmas gift for him. The mensoverandunder.com Christmas set is the perfect combo for accessories for the sophisticated gentleman. View Christmas ideas, ladies. That's a big white button, and it looks good. It fits the color palette of the site. It fits the color of the font. But maybe it's not noticeable enough. 
Maybe that's why people aren't clicking it. Our goal completion will help us figure out if that's true, because all we need to do to test it is change it to red. Oh, yeah, I know. Fancy, I did that with a thumb. <laughs> Maybe all we have to do is change the color. <laughs> um, now, you, now you got me. So when we change the color, we can look at our Google Analytics, and we can see if conversions are increasing. If we change the color to red and over the next 30 days, or we get A, B, and test and run at the same time, if that goal completions go higher, red was a better color to pick. So we either keep red or we try a different color to see if we can do better, because you can always get better. Or if they go down, we go back to white, because white was the right choice. And then we try a different color. The point is, is you can start measuring things, you can start tracking things, and you can always refine on a website. So if there's two things that you take away from this first talk that I give today, is when you're designing, I, I know I'm talking specifically about your website, but any marketing campaign, any ad copy, anywhere, think about your message first. Design with your content and message, because that's what's converting your visitors, not the flashy graphics. They're just eye candy. Your message sells, your brand sells. And more importantly, once you launch that, once you put that campaign out in the world, once you launch that website, track it. Because we don't know where we're going if we don't know where we are. And if we're not tracking what's happening, we can't refine our strategy. And if we can't refine our strategy, we're not going to grow our circle of influence. And for now, that's all I have for you. I'll see you guys later. Thank you.